I repeat, SOS. This is Corporal Davis of the... So, paint the town red, huh? You've probably seen Jacksepticeye Captain Source play at some point. Well, this is old UI. Paint the town red is a first person brawler, releasing in July of 2021, but being in early access way before that. Being developed by Selfies Games, a couple of geezers from the Landtown Hunt. <laughs> That's such a bad impression, I'm sorry. It utilizes a voxel system for its enemies, which basically means they're made out of tiny blocks that can be dynamically destroyed. You can slice, dice, beat, bash, slam, smite, and splatter enemies to your heart's content, and because it's cute people, the violence is really funny and not fucked up. Out of the four game modes present in this game, one has always stuck out to me, the Beneath. Scenarios user-made levels in the arena are just your standard brawler fair, kill everything in the level in however a violent fashion you want, but Beneath is nothing like that, it's a roguelike. And considering out of my three high effort videos, two of them have been roguelike focused, it's safe to say I have an itch for that sort of thing. Sucks the Beneath is ass. I feel like I need to preface this by saying that Paint the Town Red is actually like, in my top 10 games of all time. I don't know exactly where I'll place it, but it's definitely there. And since no one asked, these are what the top 10 games would be. I'm not making this video because I want to shit talk a random side mode in this indie game. I'm making it because I really like Paint the Town Red and I wish the Beneath was better because it's genuinely a really interesting concept that doesn't just fall flat, no, 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 no. It, face plants into the ground at Mark 3. Where do the problems start? Literally, at the start. That's not an exaggeration by the way. Beneath just kind of drops you in the thick of it. There is an intro cutscene, but you want to know what it is? It's just you, riding on an elevator down into some facility. Not only is it boring, but it doesn't even fill you in on any of the lore, and it's not like there isn't any, but I'm getting way ahead of myself. Shouldn't an opening cutscene get me, you know, hyped up? I mean, look at, uh, the, what, what, what games do we have here? Look at Risk of Rain 2, for instance. The ominous music, the huge planet compared to your tiny ship, the dialogue, they all get you ready for a dangerous mission on a mysterious planet. It makes you care and tells you what's going on, while keeping the exact details very loose. Don't get me wrong, I don't want, like, a five minute info dump, and the devs themselves did say they wanted the lore to be more environmental, but still. Surely there could have been something, something a bit more eventful than an elevator at least. If not, at least give us the option to skip it. And as for that lore, well, it's it, it, it's complicated. Take this with a grain of salt, but from my understanding in the Paint the Town Red board, deep underground there's another dimension of sorts, which is just called the Beneath by the way, it never actually gets a name as far as I'm aware, and is ruled by powerful powerful in air quotes, beings called the Elder Gods that for some reason want to rule and invade the Earth and have already tried to invade it. The UHDF, a military organization, are the people trying to stop them and send soldiers underground in an attempt to kill the Elder Gods. That's you. You're just one of those many soldiers being sent underground. That seems straightforward. What could be so complicated about that? Thanks for asking random nerd JPEG, because quite a lot apparently. First problem. The Elder Gods have already tried to invade Earth and failed. Not only can that be incurred, but it's just straight up said. An Elder God already came to Earth and bit the bullet because the classes that you play as are soldiers mutated by the heart of an Elder God. So, the Elder Gods. The big bads of the game you spend the entirety of the runtime trying to kill. Yeah, one of them was just killed off screen. But that doesn't make sense because when you kill the Necromancer, another Elder God, you only unlock one class, even though four are unlocked by default. So, that either means four Elder Gods were killed off screen prior to the game taking place, or that there was one so powerful it was basically the equivalent of four Elder Gods was killed off screen prior to the game taking place. You choose which one is worse, honestly, not even I know. 
Second problem, how do the Elder Gods work, exactly? Why have they only just decided to invade now? We never get a concrete date of when this game mode takes place, but I'm pretty sure it's post 2000s. You know, a time period where we can easily communicate overseas, as well as having access to modern weapons, including fighter jets, tanks, and nukes. It's implied to have something to do with the scenario levels, I think it's hinted that they're being influenced by the Elder Gods and that's where your character gets special powers in those levels, and the fact that there are hidden runes that glow the more you kill people. So the Elder Gods influence people on the surface to go on killing sprees and get power from it. Okay, and I'm guessing that they finally decide to invade after they gain enough power, that all makes sense. Until you realize that this has been going on for nearly 300 years. The first scenario level takes place in 1726. But for some reason, the next scenario level, which doesn't have a confirmed date, takes place a good bit later, sometime after 1835 because there's a revolver. Then the next one isn't until the... <coughs> then the next one isn't until the 1970s. What, 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 what is that consistency? Why are there such huge gaps in between them making people go on killing sprees? Wouldn't it make more sense to just do it all as soon as possible? Because call me crazy, I think invading us in the 1700s would be significantly easier than the 2000s. This is back when a gun took like 2-5 to five business days to reload. As far as I can tell, there is never a reason given or even hinted as to why the other gods take their sweet ass time invading the earth. And problem number 3, what is the motive of the elder gods? Why do they want to invade the earth? It can't be to expand, the beneath seems pretty big and not only that, but out of the 4 elder gods, 3 of them rule over their own dimension. It could be for resources, but nothing in the game hints at that. The only reason I can think of is because they're just a bunch of assholes, and I mean, if that's the reason, f fair enough, I guess. The lore could have been interesting. In fact, there are some little environmental details that I like, and trying to give story to the scenario levels is nice. It's just I don't think enough is told to us. I like that the lore is what you make of it, but there's not enough stuff given to me to make of it. Too much is just left unanswered or left to interpretation. But let's be honest, you don't care about the story. This is the funny haha gory block game. How's that gameplay look? At the core of it all, it's pretty good. Controls are fluid, weapons feel weighty and have a good impact to them, killing enemies is satisfying, especially with the just absurd amount of blood, and because of the voxels, no two kills will feel the same. I especially love how sometimes when you hit an enemy with a blunt weapon, they just explode for some reason, so I say, why do they do that? If anyone's a programmer, let me know. I've been curious about this for years. But you see, there's a problem. Good controls and funny gore isn't exclusive to the Beneath, that, that's just paint the town red as a whole. So does Beneath do anything unique? Yes. Yes it does. Quite a lot in fact. Is any of it good? Uh... Classes are probably the most defining feature. The shit. From the start, you'll have the Brawler, Spectre, Vanguard, and Warlock all unlocked. Classes are pretty much two things, a set of abilities and a utility skill. Besides that, they all control the same, so they can all run, jump, block, carry two weapons, etc, etc. A utility skill is just something your character can always do, where abilities require you to power them up first by killing enemies. One of the two good classes is Brawler, who is so astronomically better than everyone else, it's honestly kind of depressing. Comparing any of a class to Brawler is like comparing a trained Navy SEAL with an M16 to a 6 year old with a slingshot. In a wheelchair. It's not even a contest, let's be honest. His utility skill is definitely the worst part. It's a kick. Which unless you have full stamina deals very painful damage, and even when you're at full stamina all it does is stagger, stagger, I, I keep stirring that fucking word, it's pissing me off. Stagger big enemies or knock weak ones over, draining all your stamina in the process. Don't use it. Knocking over an enemy is nice, but I want to run. His skills though, definitely make up for it. Shockwave just sends every father enemy near you flying. The impact can and probably will kill at least a few of them. Great for making space and clearing paths. Stone Skin gives you a huge defense boost for an extended period of time. This thing lasts forever and reduces damage so much, it's scary. Attacks that would normally have you knocking on death's door are nothing more than a mild inconvenience now. And Berserk makes you temporarily enter a frenzy where at most you're going to hit an enemy twice before they die. So, he's already got a stacked power set, but I will admit... I lied. Because every class has one more thing to them. Stats. And this is why this guy is so busted. His health is the highest. His damage is the highest. His weapon durability is the second highest, literally the only thing 
that isn't good is speed, and honestly, that's very manageable. Plus, there are multiple ways to boost speed. Spectre is the only other good class, and honestly, he's not bad. Again, it's just that compared to Brawler, it's not even a contest. His stats are all below average with the exception of speed, which is all the way at the top. His utility is a dash that doubles as a body slam, letting him knock over weak enemies. It is very fun and actually useful since you can still run and use it because it's segmented, only using half your stamina a dash. His abilities ain't all that bad either. Enchant Weapon lets you enchant a weapon which drastically increases its damage and durability. The only other way to do this is to go to the shop and enchant it for money. God bless capitalism. So being able to do it whenever you want, for free, is obviously pretty useful. And teleport causes you to do an extended dash forward, sending out multiple explosive projectiles, turning any horde of enemies on screen into a nice creamy tomato soup. And that's it, he doesn't have a third ability. <sighs> His third ability is speed, which makes him move really fast for a bit. Just ignore how Spectre is already leagues above everybody else in terms of speed. Yeah, he totally needs an ability that gives him more speed. Which, by the way, makes you so fast, it's actually kind of hard to control. Vanguard, in all fairness, isn't all that bad. He's just really boring. Vanguard's health and damage are average, his speed is above average, and his weapon durability is the best. His utility skill lets him charge weapons, which is basically a temporary and less powerful enchantment. It's on a long cooldown, but if you use it at the right time on a good weapon, it can really help out. His abilities, though, are a very volatile bunch. Light Blast is the worst ability in this game. Overall, some characters are worse, but Light Blast is single-handedly the worst ability in this game. All it does is send out this little dinky projectile forward that knocks enemies back a bit. If you think that just sounds like a worse Shockwave, you're right. Shockwave has a much wider area affecting everything around you, while Light Blast only happens in front of you. And Shockwave's knockback is much more potent. This thing just kind of feels like I'm shoving the enemies a bit. His second ability, Rejuvenation, creates a small healing pool that heals him and any allies in it. Yeah, Beneath has co-op. This is like the only ability that ties into that. I haven't mentioned that up until this point because I don't have friends. It's good, just really tedious because the pool heals slowly and forces you to stand still. So I hope you enjoy doing this a lot. And Smite. Strike me down, Zeus. You don't have the ball. Does that. I, I don't really have much else to say. Then there's the Warlock, whose stats are. Wow. These are. All bad. Yeah. Warlock's whole shtick is that their stats are really bad, but his utility skill is ranged fireball. Which is also really bad. Its damage is mediocre, it makes you drop shields, the projectile is slow, it drains stamina, it's really awkward to use because there's a second-ish delay between you pressing the button and the fireball actually coming out because there's an animation that has to play, I could go on. His first ability is Seeker, which is the second worst ability in this game. All it does is launch out a few slow seeking projectiles that hit for okay damage. The only reason this is better than Light Blast is because this at least does damage. Firebomb is pretty self-explanatory. Big fireball, throw it out, boom. And chaos temporarily makes enemies attack each other instead of you. Really good for taking heat off your back, but do two good abilities save this class? Uh, no, no, no. Playing Warlock is awful. Bad health and speed make you frail and slow, coupled with bad damage and durability. It makes killing enemies feel like working a 9 to 5. And all of this for a dinky little fireball? It's like if I broke your legs and gave you AIDS, but in return you got like a war pistol or something. But surely it can't get any worse, right? The Corrupted is an unlockable class, only being accessible after killing the Necromancer for the first time. I mean it when I say this guy genuinely has nothing going for him. Stats wise, he's even worse than the Warlock. His health and damage are lower than him, while his weapon durability is a little bit higher, and his speed is surprisingly decent actually, I don't know why his speed is so high. That speed is his one saving grace by the way, because higher weapon durability means nothing when he deals less damage, meaning he has to hit enemies more. 
Surely there must be some kind of ace in the hole, right? Yeah, sure, if you consider a dried up dog turd an ace in the hole. His utility skill is Drain, which damages nearby enemies and converts that damage to health. Please ignore how Corrupted literally has the lowest health in the game. Acid Rain just makes a small little cloud that hits enemies for middling damage and can easily be walked through. Even if you try and kite enemies to stay inside it, the damage still won't be anything great. The only use I got out of this was using it on big enemies, in which case it's alright I guess. Entangle completely stops enemies in place for a few seconds, and even works on big enemies unlike other crowd control. Why does this cost 2 bars of power? Like, it's alright, but costing 2 bars of power to stun a few enemies for a couple of seconds isn't a very good investment, especially when compared to other CC abilities which only cost 1 bar of power. And Raise Dead will revive any recently killed enemy and turn them into allies. I really want to like this more, but it's just killed by the fact that a lot of enemies are far slower than you, meaning you outpace them and quickly lose any ally because of how big the map is. And I mean, even ignoring that, 9% of the time the people you bring back will just die again like 20 seconds later anyway. I mean it when I say Corrupted might be the worst class I've ever played in the game ever. I've played Jacob and Esau, I've played Melting, I've played as the Convict, yes bite me, I think the Convict is really bad. They ain't got shit on the Corrupted. There is nothing good, or worst of all, fun about this guy. Surely it can't get any worse, right? Well, the next class... Wait, that's it? There are only five classes? I mean, I already know that, but you gotta keep the script flowing somehow, you know? Five classes. Five classes. It doesn't even make sense. Why is the only unlockable character accessible after being the first boss? Wouldn't the last one make more sense? Because God knows you don't get anything else for being in, but I am getting way too ahead of myself for that. Five classes. No cool designs, no customizable skills, no unique items or weapons for them, on top of design decisions that I'm still trying to wrap my head around. The character with the smallest health pool gets lifesteal. The fastest character has an ability that makes them go faster. The brawler existing and just invalidating every other class. I would have been fine with a smaller roster if said roster was actually good. You could have made corrupted like Rex and make his abilities use health instead of kills. Then lifesteal actually makes sense. You could have given brawler some kind of unique throw ability with his weapons. You could have not given the speed character a speed ability. I'm sorry, I'm still questioning that one. Why? And you want to hear the best part? Classes are actually the best feature. It only gets worse from here. Buckle in, boys. But you know what? Before we dive in deeper, I think I need a quick break from all this negativity. Was there anything I actually liked about the Beneath? Yes, actually. The atmosphere. As much as I want to add like every single part of this game mode is the worst thing ever, I can't back to the atmosphere, I'm sorry. As I'm playing through the levels, I get this feeling of, I should not be here. The ambience, it, it's palpable. The drone, the distant noises that could honestly be anything but to me sound like distant roaring. I get this feeling that I'm not alone. I mean, I I'm not, but in that sort of, I'm being watched kind of way. Like something is following me just out of sight. The enemies as well also contribute a lot to the atmosphere. All the beneath exclusive ones, boar worms, leapers, interceptors have these harsh, sharp, monstrous roars, flowing heads sound ghostly, giant mages make noises that vaguely resemble a language. The sound design is all on point, mixed with the already great weapon and gore sound design. I also like some of the lore details. In the first area, a bunch of destroyed and ripped up military equipment can be found littering the place, clearly telling the player that stuff went down here. And my favorite one is the floating heads. They're obviously the heads of giant mages that are being resurrected using some kind of magic, but flowing heads are not only more common, but also found much earlier and higher up in the beneath, while giant mages are only found near the end of the game at lower parts of it, and are really rare. There used to be a lot of giant mages, but something wiped them out. I'm invested and immersed in this world. I want to know what happened to the giant mages. I want to feel like I'm going into some unknown ancient world full of horrors, but for that to work, I need to be immersed in the gameplay too. So, the objective is simple. You start at A and have to make your way over to B. The compass at the top of your screen will tell you where B is. Kill enemies along the way to get gold, which lets you buy stuff, mainly items, and like a lot of roguelikes, when you die, you start back at square one. There's something missing though. You know, the thing that this genre is built around? Variety? Every run feels the same. There's a good amount of items, enemies, and weapons, but that doesn't mean anything. It's an illusion of variety. The thing that hurts most are the weapons. 
they are what you'll use to paint the town red after all, they're kind of important. Every scenario level in the arena have a bunch of unique weapons, machetes, baseball bats, knives, pool cues, spears, katanas, flintlocks, tasers, shotguns, food, pans, pool balls, mugs, wine glasses, <sighs> and who could forget what is objectively the best weapon in the game, the pimp stick. Every weapon fit the area you used it in, so when there's a game mode with literal magic, I don't think it's crazy to expect at least a few cool weapons. Why the fuck are all of these just scenario weapons? A lot of these weapons are either just already existing ones with a fancy coat of paint and maybe a few stat changes here or there, or are actually already existing ones. The obsidian weapons look really cool, but that's about it. This club right here is just a baseball bat. These knives are just... well, knives. This isn't a problem in and of itself, if said weapons weren't also here. This means that the weapon pool gets clogged up by so many weapons that are just functionally the same because of how the weapon spawning works. So instead of getting something useful like a ranged weapon or a katana, you get a pickaxe or hatchet which might as well be the same. There are a few weapons that are just supposed to be worse versions of already existing ones which is fine I guess, but it's so easy to get the upgraded versions through the mare progression, again just kind of clogging up the weapon pool. The worst part though is just the lack of variety. Out of all the weapons, which is, I don't know, probably a good 60, 70 ish, three of them have an elemental effect. The same elemental effect. And one of them is an already existing weapon that was just poured over from the scenario levels. That's the extent of variety we get. No weapons have unique properties, there's no weapon that's like a chainsaw that requires fuel or an explosive weapon. We don't get nothing like that. What that basically means is that all you're going to carry is a katana and a shotgun. Sure, there are alternatives. There are a lot of other ranged weapons besides the shotgun, but the crossbows are bad, the taser is worse, and the harpoon gun is good, a lot of fun, but still pales in comparison to just the raw damage of the shotgun, which can casually one-shot bosses. Now obviously weapons aren't the only integral thing for every run. What about items? You know what, give me a second. Oh, sorry. You see, I was gonna talk about items next, but then I realized, wait, this is just Risk of Rain but bad. So I played Risk of Rain instead. Yeah, I know it's the second time I'm mentioning this game now, but I really mean it. Items in this game are just Risk of Rain, but bad. You get a lot of them, from shops and from pedestals, but none of them will single-handedly win you the run, unlike some <coughs> other roguelikes. <coughs> so a lot of items are just small little bonuses, but in turn, you get a lot of items. This is actually a system I prefer, it's why I also love RoboQuest. With a lot of roguelikes, the item effects can range from actively hindering your run to just handing you the win on a silver platter. In something like Isaac, for instance, on average only getting a few items every level, so it can feel like such a gamble and create very volatile runs. You could start off with something amazing and then get literally nothing else eventful for the rest of the run, or vice versa where one item can single-handedly save an otherwise lost run. With a system like this, you're gradually getting stronger in increments. All those little bonuses really start to add up. Do I really need to tell you they fucked this up? My dog's barking. <laughs> Fuck, goddammit dog. There are no different item pools. Every item is just in one big universal pool, and there are no rarities either. In theory, this could work, as long as every item is around the same in terms of usefulness. In execution... <sighs> yeah, the item balance is all over the place. You could get a 25% attack speed increase, which is really good, or a 5%, yes, a 5% chance to ignite enemies on hit, which is just a little bit of damage over time. It feels like half the items are great, while the other half are awful. One second I get extra weapon durability or ammo, the next I have a 20% chance to poison the enemy that hit me, which is also just a little bit of damage over time. I mean, you could have at least made it a guaranteed chance. I mean, like, come on, it's not gonna hurt anybody if it's guaranteed. Some items also stack, which has the exact same problem. One second that 25% attack speed increase could go up to 50%, and then the next second that 5% chance to ignite enemies on hit now spreads to nearby enemies. It's, it's still a 5% chance. And there's also this. <laughs> There are 30 items. I'm not expecting something like an Isaac which has, oh my god. But 30 items is pitiful. You'll see all of them in like, maybe three runs tops, if that. But that's not even the worst part. There are one, two, two items that affect raw stats. That being speed, stamina, and health. 
instead of making those stats tied to items, you instead buy boosters. Again, in theory, this could work, but in execution, it sucks. I like that my raw stats aren't tied to RNG. I've lost a good few runs in other roguelikes purely because RNG felt like bending me over sideways and giving me no health or no speed. The problem is that they cost double of what an item does. So that means early on, you almost never buy them because it's more worth it to use that gold on weapons or enchantments or items. But later on, because of the map progression, you'll have so much gold that you can just casually buy any boost that you see. So your stats will look like this by the end of any given run. If you just made them cost 500 gold like an item does, it would create this really unique dynamic early on. Spend that gold on an item, or play it safe and increase your stats. But no, only the upper class get to upgrade their stats apparently, so I don't know, the middle class can go fuck themselves. Finally, there's enemies. It might look like there's a lot of them, but let me just bust out the sharpie real quickly. Get rid of this one, get rid of these ones, this one too. These are the only enemies that really matter. Acolytes and zombies make up a good 85% of the enemies you'll be fighting, and they are pretty much the same thing. Acolytes are weak melee fighters that rely on numbers, zombies are weak melee fighters that rely on numbers. There's no reason for both of these enemies to exist. Zombies could be removed from the game outright and it would play no differently because at least acolytes have a little bit of variety to them. They can have shields and at low health they get this lunge attack, while zombies don't do that. They have nothing to them besides a weak melee attack. Even the tentacle mutant variant they introduced doesn't do anything unique, he's just kind of a slower zombie that deals a bit more damage and has a larger attack radius. Speaking of variant, yeah, there's nothing done to spice either of these enemies up. I mean, besides the tentacle mutant. There's no big bruiser acolytes that are slower but have more health, there's no acolytes with armor, there's no ranged acolytes. This wouldn't be the end of the world if they didn't already fucking exist. Yeah, the acolytes, god that word is starting to lose any meaning it had, are just reskin brawler enemies from the scenario levels. And guess what? There were bigger brawlers. There were brawlers wearing armor. There are brawlers with ranged weapons. So why are they not in the beneath? The attempt to spice up the father enemies comes in the form of interceptors, which despite looking different, might as well just be a slightly bigger acolyte. Because I shit you not, they are functionally the same. They are just weak melee enemies that rely on numbers. They're not very strong or fast. Even the wiki mentions how much of a pushover they are. Like, you, you can't make this up. As much as I want to go into agonizing detail about every enemy, how about we don't and I just give them all a quick brief overview? Floating heads and crystal entities. Visually, they're unique enemies. Functionally, they just charge at you. Best part is crystal entities are infinitely worse despite being a later game enemy. Flowing heads will randomly charge you, only laying off a brief screech as a warning, which can catch you off guard, while the crystal boys will spend a whole business week charging up their super attack, only to slowly charge at you for at best moderate damage. You can easily kite them into electrocuting other enemies as well, so they, they are just a complete pushover. Leapers are a late game enemy, for some reason, you could, you could have fooled me, that leap at you for really low damage. They forgot to put this thing in the sandbox, the level that literally lets you spawn in every enemy in the game. That's all I really have to say, they might be the most forgettable enemy I've ever seen ever. Teleporters teleport. All of about 5 feet and throw very weak, very slow projectiles at you. They also have no health. What's the threat of these guys supposed to be? Hydras in concept are really cool. They're a three-headed dragon that has a unique behavior depending on how many heads they have left. Them only dying when you cough all three heads. In execution though, it basically just turns into a game of, do I have a sharp weapon? If you don't, they're basically impossible to kill, so just walk around them. They're really slow, so it's not that hard. And if you do, they're so easy to kill that I usually don't even process that I just killed an enemy. Also, they look really goofy, but honestly, I'm here for it. And finally, the statue and observer are just melee enemies. I don't have anything of substance to say about either of them. The statue does the weeping angel thing, where when you're not looking at it, it moves faster. But I mean it when I say I had to look that up, because that is how useless the mechanic is. I did not know they did that until I looked it up. There are four more enemies, even though it's basically three, that I think deserve more of a detailed look at, though. Crystal crabs can choke on my whole dick. Their gimmick is that they charge up a laser attack, they hit you for really high damage. Like, really, really high damage. And that charge up? It's about 3-ish seconds. So let me get this straight. 
this thing, this stupid ass crystal with four little stick man legs coming out of it, you find on the first level completely outclasses two late game enemies. It deals more damage than the teleporter while having less charge than the crystal entity on top of its laser basically being hit scan. These things are the worst enemy in this mode. I love just being randomly one shot from across the map because if there's anything I like about games, it's one shots. I love one shots. One shots are amazing. One shots are live. I love that hitting the legs can be a pain in the ass because fun fact, that crystal is invincible and hitting it will deal damage. If you're wondering why I move so sporadically sometimes, these fuckers are why. Because at a moment's notice, I could just get one shot from across the room. And in case that wasn't bad enough, they introduced a blue variant that's whole gimmick is that it deals more damage. So they just make an enemy that hits for high damage, hit for higher damage. Isn't that like giving an alligator wings and opposable thumbs? Do you really need to make something that's already deadly just that little bit deadlier? That's a horrifying thought now that I think about it. Thankfully though, there's a light at the end of this tunnel in the form of giant mages and minions. Minions commit the crime of actually being a balanced range enemy. They can charge up a laser attack, that laser tracking you and constantly dealing damage. They're weak, but also really scrawny and kind of awkward to hit. They're not too strong or too weak. They hit a perfect balance. I actually didn't think the game had it in it, I'm not gonna lie. And giant mages are kind of like little mini bosses. They have a bunch of attacks, including a shockwave, summoning enemies, spawning homing bolts that follow the player, and have unique interactions with other enemies. Because minions, and interceptors I guess, will try and protect them. Why isn't there more enemy interaction? Giant mages are the best enemy in this game, hands down. My only complaint is that they could be a bit faster and a bit more durable because one good katana swing is enough to one-shot them. I mean, I feel like swinging katana in most people's head would one-shot them, but that's besides the point. Enemies interacting with each other is such a cool concept. Like, all I'm thinking about is some kind of acolyte that attaches bombs to leapers and turns them into suicide bombers. There's so much missed potential with this concept. And if you think that the only problems I have are with weapons, items, and enemies, then I'll give that runtime a little check, buddy. There is still a lot of it left. There is no run diversity. There is one, one type of room in the form of challenge rooms, which are so boring, I don't actually think I got any footage of them. You have to clear out a room with a time limit or some really annoying challenge, like not being able to run. And in return, you get weapons that you can just find lying around on the floor or in shops. They do not give anything unique. Interactables too. There is one besides the pedestals that you find lying around, that being the skeleton guy. You have the option to give him health or gold in exchange for an item. You have to be an idiot to use health though, because items from this guy are actually cheaper than buying them normally. It's only 300 gold compared to the normal 500 that costs at shops or pedestals. So, why why would I use health? You get no benefit from using health, so it's, it's just pointless. And don't think there's any kind of event either. Think Risk of Rain with the family events or Isaac with the curse laws. The most developed mechanic is the Shard Lords. They're these mini bosses you'll randomly find in levels, and two of them are just melee enemies, like they have no gimmick or anything interesting to them. One of them is just a brawler with a shield and a high damage weapon. One of them is just a weaker minion. One of them is just a teleporter who made clones. By the way, it's very easy to tell which one is the real one because the clones won't have any damage on them. And one of them is a crystal crab that fires five lasers at once. Basically meaning if you don't get behind cover the moment it charges up that beam attack, you'll get one shot. You know what? No. No, no, it's, it's too obvious. This is just rage bait. There is no way they made this enemy and didn't see any problems with it. It's just the troll, and I'm not falling for it. Also, I know this isn't really gameplay related, but these guys look really lame. The Beast is the one exception. He looks pretty cool and actually has a unique animation, but everyone else, they're just kind of recolored enemies that are being sized up a bit. And not even the Golem could be bothered to go that far. He's literally just a statue enemy, but sized up a bit. That is it. I mean, come on, you could have at least given him like a slightly different shade of gray or... Oh yeah, right, this guy's a thing. The Pursuer is a sort of soft clock. They have a chance to be active on a level, and after enough time has passed, they spawn out a random part of the map and constantly follow you. They go through walls, they can't be killed, with the exception of ancient weapons, which are only found on the last level, and they will kill you very fast. They also kill any other enemy they touch. Yeah, enemies can friendly fire, I, I don't think I've said that. You're probably very sick of hearing this, but on paper, I really like this idea. You could have maybe had some kind of special chest that gives you a unique powerful weapon but in exchange reduces the amount of time before a pursuer shows up. 
They could have made an enemy that has me panicking and trying to clear out a level as fast as I can just to avoid it, but they are such a pushover. They're slow, they're predictable, you can hide from them in shops, and because of the friendly fire, they're honestly more of a hindrance to other enemies than you. And they take forever to spawn in. I mean it when I say, I didn't have one of them spawn in naturally during my entire playthrough. It's not like I was trying to blitz through levels, it's just there's that little to keep you occupied that you'll probably end up clearing levels early anyway. And if you do clear levels too early... <laughs> this... Door. For some reason, this door right here will block the exit of a level. The only way that thing is going down is if A, enough time passes, or B, you pay for it. They actually punish you if you clear out a level too fast. Shouldn't, shouldn't that be the other way around? Shouldn't I get rewarded for clearing out a level fast? I really hope you enjoy staring at concrete, because if you get here too early, your gameplay for the next few minutes is going to look like this. <laughs> Despite how much I've been whining, a lot of stuff in Beneath honestly doesn't bother me that much. Like, yeah, it's boring, but I'm not losing sleep because Corrupted sucks. This door is one of the two things that actively pisses me off. Well, three things, but one of them was deliberately made to piss me off, so I'm not counting that. I'm being punished because I clear a level too fast. In what fucking world does that make sense? It's not like it works in tandem with the pursuer, because even after the door goes down, there's still a good few minutes where he just won't spawn in. So, just to recap, three of the five classes are not fun to play, the lore is a huge nothing burger, there are no unique weapons in a pool of who knows how many, items suck, enemies suck for the most part, there's no run variety in a roguelike, there is no interesting gimmicks, and this door can go fuck itself. I want to pretend like it doesn't get any worse, but it, it does, it, it, get, it only gets worse from here. What about those bosses, huh? Hey, I said the same thing, and I'm the one actually playing this. These bosses have got to be the most underwhelming, underpowered, unfun set of bosses I've seen in a roguelike ever. The Necromancer is first. He's the only boss who doesn't have any kind of criteria you need to meet, you just kind of play until you get to him. Design-wise, he's fine, he's just kind of a giant mage with some extra drip, but honestly, I don't mind that. Fight-wise, you have to kill these 8 minions scattered around the arena before you can actually harm them. Some parts of the arena also have traps, so you should probably watch out for those. Once you actually kill the minions though, uh, wow, this guy goes down like a sack of bricks. He doesn't have much health, and most of his attacks are really weak, including his namesake where he can resurrect enemies. The exception are these slow green bolts he can summon in, just like a normal giant mage. They force you to keep moving and will shred your health, but that's really it. Just kill all the minions and make sure not to stand around for too long, and that's it. Killing this guy shouldn't really be much of a problem. Once you kill him, it will net you the Corrupted class, and honestly, game, you, you can keep him. You can keep him, trust me, I, I don't really want it. Then there's the Aberration, who you can only fight after defeating the Necromancer. He's pretty simple. Take this shield at the start of a run and take it to this shrine right here in Crystal Caves Act 1. Boom by the boom, you're in the islands. Jesus Christ, I'd rather be in Guantanamo Bay. I've not really mentioned areas up until this point, not because they're bad, but because they're not really anything to write home about, gameplay-wise at least. Design-wise, they look good. The caves and crystal caves, really kind of giving it another name though, are just an area. They don't have any kind of gimmick. No, I don't count these green crystal weapons as a gimmick. The ruins are a little bit more interesting. They have giant mages, more unique layouts with a few different room types, as well as this gimmick where you can't leave certain rooms until you've killed designated enemies. As for boss exclusive areas, thankfully the other two I'm gonna bring up soon aren't that bad, but the islands, oh the islands, oh boy. If you couldn't tell already, they're islands. Specifically, floating islands, which you can fall off of. I don't think that when you fall off, you just get teleported back at the cost of taking some damage. No, 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 no. You fall off, instant death. If this was something that was entirely player error, it would be frustrating, but fair. Until you look at these little shit biscuits. Charges were an enemy that I didn't mention earlier because they're supposed to work in tandem with this area. These guys are purely made to knock you off the map. The charge they do doesn't deal much damage, but flings you. I don't think I need to tell you why that's dangerous here. If the charges weren't here, I probably wouldn't mind the islands. If falling off the map just damaged you instead of one-shotting you, 
I probably wouldn't mind the islands. But these two things working together make this place just so frustrating. One charger catches you off guard, enjoy what's probably immediate death. Thankfully, you can save scum it, which normally is something I don't like to do, but honestly, I, I don't care. If this area wants to do some unfair bullshit, then I'm gonna use some unfair bullshit tactics. Get through the islands after pulling out who knows how much hair, and you'll come face to face with the aberration, whose design I actually really like, because, you see, this island you're flying him on, it's not like a boss arena. This guy is the boss arena. He's a living island, and honestly, that's pretty cool. It would really be a shame if this positivity was immediately broken by me talking about the gameplay. Yeah, this fight is awful. There's no two ways around it. All you do is play whack-a-mole with tentacles while enemies spawn in. That's all this fight amounts to. The tentacles attack, but they're so easy to kill, it won't matter. And when you do kill him, you get... Literally nothing. I'm not being the slightest bit hyperbolic. You get nothing for killing this guy. No class, no item, no nothing. You don't even get any of the mere progression currency, which would have at least been something. You literally just kill this guy for progression. I just summed up one of the four bosses in a five line paragraph. That's a good sign. Then there's the trickster, who is easily the best boss, but of course there's a catch. Getting to this guy is so ass backwards and unintuitive. The first step isn't that bad. You can find this ball which tells you how to capture a pursuer using this device you can buy from the shop. It just sucks because once you place down the device, you'll be waiting a good bit for that pursuer to actually show up. But then, all logic just kind of goes out the window. Go back to the base where you'll find that pursuer captured and contained. Grab the heart and bring it to this guy. Wait an agonizingly long time for him to go back to the starting area where he gets shot down by turrets. Start a new run and you'll see this red thing. Play through four runs, or just cheese it by abandoning runs over and over again. Get to either the first or second level of the ruins where you'll find this covered in this red stuff. I, I don't know, is it tentacles, tendrils? Who knows? Find this giant mage, make a pursuer go over his body so he drops his staff, use that staff to find a pursuer portal, shoot it with the staff, and boom, you're in the construct. And if you want to go back and refight him, not that there is any reason to do it outside of the first time you kill him, you'll still have to get to the ruins, find the level covered in the nondescript red stuff, find the giant mage, make the pursuer kill him, and use that staff to find the portal. Do you think they could have made gang to this guy a tad bit less of a pain in the ass? That really sucks as well, because Trickster is easily the best boss, hell, the best segment because of his level. You start in this hub and can pick between four different areas all stylized around the scenario levels. You're stuck using scenario weapons too, which are much less powerful than the beneath weapons, but this is counterbalanced by the fact that you have classes and items. Yeah, I know it's a reuse of assets, but at least it's a cool reuse of assets. Seeing different twisted and warped takes on the scenario levels is cool, and for the most part, they're well designed. Except for the disco level because there had to be an insta-kill pit somewhere, didn't there? Beat all four of these levels and you can go fight the trickster. His design is pretty cool, the four faces on each side of his head thing is really creepy, and the fight is very interesting. He switched between a bunch of stances that all have different behaviours, and the only way to properly kill him is to collect enough of these green cubes. It's a very fight that, while sure, isn't super difficult, is at least something more than a boss who summons a bunch of minions. Well, for the most part, it isn't super difficult. There is one stance though, his pirate stance, that is just a load of horseshit. When he does this attack, the arena you fight in will flood, and the only thing you can stand on are these rocks. The trickster will create a cannon in this phase that knocks you back. The problem is the water. Yeah, it's a one shot. So one wrong move, and enjoy going back through this whole staff thing again. Giving the boss that is the hardest to reach two different insta kills has to be deliberate, there is no way that's on accident. I think the devs just like making you suffer, I'm not gonna lie. When you kill the trickster, you actually get two things, jack and shit. Yeah, being this guy doesn't give you anything evil. Despite this though, the trickster is still the best fight, easily. It's the most unique and the construct is, for the most part, a welcome change of pace. It even has a secret where you can nab this broken as hell later katana that is unbreakable and pretty much one shots everything in the game. Just wish getting to the construct wasn't like pulling teeth. But then... There's the end. That's actually his name by the way, it's just the end. I need to be very mad for a second. This isn't my first time being the Beneath. In fact, I beat it... Three years ago in 2021. Jesus Christ, time really does fly. And ever since, I wanted to make a video on the Beneath. 
but one thing turns into another, personal stuff gets in the way, I fall out with some friends, I get verbally harassed for a few weeks because of an Overwatch rank. Yes, that actually happened, and no, I will not elaborate further. All of my memory of this mode was basically gone. I know I played it, I have the Steam achievements to back it up, but besides that, everything is pretty much a blur. With the exception of this fucker. I had spent a few days playing through this mode, and eventually, I killed the other three Elder Gods. I didn't know what to expect because up until this point, the only thing I've looked up was how to get to the Trickster because, of course. I get to this gate, really excited to see what the last level looks like, and I'm met by fire and blood. In an actual gameplay sense, it's boring. You just go to one island, kill a few enemies that spawn, that unlocks a path to another island where you kill a few enemies that spawn, rinse and repeat a third time, that's it. I would get mad at the lava because you guessed it, insta-kill, but honestly, it's, it's not an issue. Neither are the pursuers because this level actually spawns a lot of them and sometimes they'll follow you. Thankfully, the ground is littered with these ancient weapons which can actually kill them, so one good throw and boom, the thing that was barely even a threat is now literally not a threat. Visually as well, it's so boring. It's just hell. Like, look up a picture of hell and this is what it will look like. Lava, rock, barrenness, well, hell, I guess. You could have at least taken some other elements, maybe have some mountains or castles in the distance, have hands coming out of the ground, I don't know, just like other hell imagery. Even at the time, I remember distinctly thinking that this level was lame, but I thought maybe that was the point. Maybe it's like one of those things where you do something really underwhelming before a fight, kind of lure you into a full sense of security. So I press on to this portal, I go through, and I end up here. This has the making of a great fight written all over it. The music, the straight ominous path leading to the big ominous laser. I get ready for a fight. Only to realize I can't hurt him, so I run around for a bit, staying as far away as I can, only for him to suddenly rush to his throne and... This fight's just a glorified boss rush, isn't it? The end is the final boss of the Beneath, and God does he just fucking suck. Firstly, his design is just... Wow. This is the most bland, uninspired thing ever. What the fuck happened? The other three Elder Gods are pretty good looking, so why is the final boss just some generic ass lava golem looking guy? In fact, do you know what he looks like? He looks like that one magma rock monster from Doom Syndicate in Megamind, or this Fortnite skin. These are not who I should be comparing your final boss to. And the fight. The fight. Motherfucker, what fight? Does this even count as one? I spend 99% of the battle just running away from him. The end is completely immune to attacks. It's not that I hate this idea. On the contrary, actually. I think a boss that forces you to play defensively can be a fun challenge. But the thing is, this one does not. It's not like I have to carefully block and dodge attacks. No, I just have to run away. The end is so slow, you almost never have to actually get close to him unless you want to. His attacks as well just do not complement him. He has basic melee attacks, but also two shockwave attacks. Close ranged shockwave attacks, even though, again, most of the time you're gonna wanna be as far away from him as possible. The only attack that poses even the slightest modicum of a threat is the meter rain, which is kind of self-explanatory, but even then, it's super easy to dodge. Skeletons will also constantly spawn into the arena that you fight in. They're literally just reskin zombies, so don't think they're gonna pose any kind of a threat. I won't even bother attacking them, because it's gonna just reduce weapon durability. The end will most likely end up killing them anyway, because his attacks just indirectly do it. How do you attack him, you might ask? Most of the time with a boss like this, there's usually some kind of way to make them vulnerable to attacks. Obviously not with this guy, because that would mean he'd actually be the slightest bit of fun. And fuck you, you don't deserve it. Instead, you just wait. After enough time passes, the end will go take a breather on his throne and spawn in two shard lords. After you kill them, he goes back to attacking you, you repeat this process two more times, and you can finally damage him, where you'll probably kill him in like 10 seconds because you just have a shotgun and pow. Just like that, you beat the game. What a fucking fight. What do you think you get when you beat him? Go on. Just take a wild guess what you get. You get fuck. All. You should have seen the look on my face when it processed. I literally got nothing for being this mode. I knew it wasn't going to be a new class. There's only five pods in the classroom, but I was expecting something. A new difficulty, some kind of weapon, modifiers. Again, something that scenario levels have, by the way. 
Hell, even if it was something purely cosmetic like replacing all the blood with confetti or something like that, it would have at least been a nice gesture. Something to show that my time was respected, but no. The game basically told me to go suck on a 10-incher. And you know what? If it was between being this mode or sucking a dick, I'll take the dick. At least that only eats up about 20 to 30 minutes of my time. Being beneath from start to finish takes like 3 to 5 hours. Yes, I did just say I would rather suck a cock than play this. Somebody's probably gonna hit me with the, it was about the journey, not the destination. But the journey sucked too. It was boring and not even the slightest bit challenging, excluding any bullshit one shots. That's without the mare progression. The moment you start taking mare progression into account, this game becomes a complete cakewalk. And no, I'm not going over the mare progression. I, I just, I, I, <laughs> this video is killing me. This video was originally gonna be a big what if. I'll go through the mode and identify the problems while giving my solutions to fix them. But then I realized the video would easily be at least two hours long. And I'm not making a two hour video just yet, I'm, I'm sorry. Because this mode is just so fundamentally flawed in almost every way. I swear I was trying to find good stuff to say, but it's hard. Don't get me wrong, this mode isn't completely devoid of fun. I had fun for the first run or two, but after that it just gets so fucking monotonous. Every enemy is just an acolyte or a zombie, and there's no variation. It, it was actually like driving me insane. I swear to god, I was going loopy playing this. I know this is just the side mode, but why even bother making a roguelike if it doesn't feel like a roguelike. I'm not even mentioned all the small little nitpicks as well. The music is really forgettable, which is weird considering this game actually does have a few bangers in it. Or the fact that there is no indication whether or not a pursuer is active in the level besides the text at the start of it, or that flaming weapons don't set enemies on fire for some reason, or the fact that the beneath is really outdated. There have been a bunch of new weapons added since it came out and none of them have been added to the beneath for some reason, including another wizard staff. Why is that not in here? That'd be so cool. I would still recommend Pay the Town Bread. I mean, just scenario and user-made levels alone sell this game, plus the arena's there too, but Beneath? I I'm sorry, I just can't recommend this whether you have an itch for roguelikes or not. I'd still love to make a video about fixing the Beneath, but if I ever do, don't expect it for a good long while. There is just so much stuff that I think needs to be added, removed, or heavily reworked, and also I'd have to have a lot of art made, which means uh, I would just be on the payroll at that point, honestly. Just for the hell of it, if this video gets 35 likes, I'll move it to the top of my list. That's only like 5 more than my nuclear throne one got, so it, it's very possible. Besides that though, it's just normal outro stuff I guess. I hope you enjoyed the video, thanks to anybody who helped make this possible, no hate towards the devs even though a lot of drugs were made at their expense, like and subscribe only if you enjoyed the content, and uh, have a good day. I really wish I had something else to say, but no. Check it out, I'm in the house like carpet And if there's too many heads in my blunt I won't spark it, I'll put it in my pocket And save it like rocket fuel Till everybody's gone and it's cool Then I spark it up with my brother His mama named him Moan, but I call him Moan Lover And he's more than a cover, he's a quill We're putting shit together like the house that John built on a hill Cause this shit gonna feel like velvet, turtle My style fits tighter than a girdle If you hate it, then you can just leave it like beaver but in a day or two i'll make you a true believer in me because like the alphabet you'll see that ism kicks a rhyme not your everyday soliloquy like chef rd my rhyme is truly cooking peace to maddie rich because he's straight out of brooklyn new york i don't eat pork or swine when i dine i drink a cup of kool-aid not a big glass of wine or a hint if you have time i'll drop rhyme again